Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and with Marvel's What If Season 2, many Marvel fans can't help but ask, what if ourselves? In many ways, Marvel feels like its best days are still ahead of it, but in others, it kind of feels like somewhere down the line, we skewed onto a darkest timeline, a reality that we weren't necessarily meant to be in. If you look back at the history of all of Hollywood, there are countless nexus points in history in which the timeline veered onto its current course, but away from a completely different and equally exciting existence. Specifically, there was a a singular moment 10 years ago in the development of the first Ant-Man film in which Edgar Wright, director of Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, left his dream project of directing Ant-Man, setting Marvel Studios on a destined path of committee pre-visualized fever dreams called things like Quantumania. But instead of its current Kang headaches, could we have had a more badass Avengers in the Fantastic Four sooner? So inspired by the What If series, we at New Rockstars decided to embark upon a new series where we will explore the endless possibilities and thrilling timelines that were erased in an instant as we ask the question, what if? Time, space, reality. Movie franchise building is more than a linear path. It's a prism of endless profit possibilities where a single no thanks on a headshot can branch out into infinite better plot lines pitched on YouTube by nerds. Nerds who would make terrible movies if ever given the chance. Follow one of these nerds and ponder the question, what if? It's Friday, May 23rd, 2014. The Hollywood Reporter publishes a joint statement from Marvel Studios and director Edgar Wright, saying, The studio and director have parted ways on Ant-Man due to differences in their versions of the film. The decision to move on is amicable. The statement sent shockwaves throughout the nerd world, shaking to the core those who were delighted by Edgar Wright's test footage for the film shown at San Diego Comic-Con in July 2012. According to the book MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios by Joanna Robinson, Dave Gonzalez, and Gavin Edwards, Chapter 21, Wright Man, and wrong time, the trigger point happens the week prior, mid-May 2014, when a never-named in-house screenwriter under contract with Marvel Studios turns in a rewrite of Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish's screenplay to apply notes from the studio's shadowy creative committee. This revision left Edgar Wright quote, horrified. Meanwhile, this exact same month of May 2014, Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige was busy courting Sony Pictures head Amy Pascal to convince her to share the character of Spider-Man in a 2016 reboot in Captain America Civil War. After The Amazing Spider-Man 2 underperforms the first weekend of May 2014, Kevin Feige calls a top secret summit with his closest advisors in a Santa Monica hotel, leading to a fateful meeting with Pascal on the Sony lot. Pascal Pascal threw her sandwich at Kevin Feige and told him, quote, get the f out of here. But she comes around to the deal and both studios make billions. But did Kevin Feige's focus on locking down the Spider-Man deal in those days of May 2014 blind him from what was happening on Ant-Man right under his nose? Did this distraction allow the then rival creative force of the company of the creative committee to hijack Edgar Wright's Ant-Man script and change it so much that Edgar Wright had to walk away? What were these rewrites? Who was that fateful in-house writer? And what would an MCU steered by storytellers like Edgar Wright have looked like. Let's rewind. It's 2000. Marvel sells the film rights to Ant-Man and several other characters, including Captain America, Man-Thing, and the Punisher, to Artisan Entertainment. Edgar Wright, at that point known only for the UK sitcom of space, pitches Artisan on an Ant-Man heist movie based on his memories of John Byrne's Marvel premiere number 47 from 1979, including Scott Lang's origin story, but Artisan passes. 2003. Lionsgate buys Artisan and they allow the rights to Ant man to revert to Marvel. 2004, Edgar Wright, now the director of Shaun of the Dead, meets Kevin Feige and Avi Arad at Comic-Con. They say they never knew about his Ant-Man pitch, but his treatment now impresses them. But it's still just 2004. These men aren't yet in a position to greenlight an Ant-Man movie. It's now 2006. Edgar Wright is promoting hot fuzz. And at Comic-Con, Kevin Feige, now eager to prove Marvel as its own studio in its own cinematic universe, convinces Wright to join him on stage. He name drops Ant-Man and he says, 
listen to the characters I name that we that we work are working on currently, and you put them all together. There's no coincidence that that may someday equal the Avengers. 2008, Wright and Cornish turn in their Ant-Man completed script to Marvel. By now, the smash release of Iron Man transformed Marvel Studios into a juggernaut with a growing cinematic universe. Marvel commissions a second draft of Ant-Man, but the project takes a back burner so that Marvel can roll out its Phase One plan and Edgar Wright can focus on Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. 2011, Ant-Man's second draft is turned in. According to the MCU book, it was, quote, a sleeker version of the same story, a heist movie that featured both Pym and Lang trying to keep the Ant-Man suit away from a villain who wants to use the technology for nefarious purposes. Marvel hoped to include Ant-Man in the Avengers lineup for 2015's Avengers Age of Ultron. June 2012, Marvel pays Edgar Wright to film a day of test footage, which includes a scene of Ant-Man, played by stunt actor, fighting two men in a hallway, resizing, running down the barrel of a gun, a concept reused for the final version of the film. This footage is shown at Comic-Con in July 2012, but Edgar Wright instead decides to complete his Cornetto trilogy with The World's End, with longtime producing partner Eric Fellner, who had been diagnosed with cancer. Marvel agrees. It's now October 2013. Ant-Man's release date is set for July 2015. Production is scheduled to begin in May 2014, and development begins. December 2013, Paul Rudd is announced to play Scott Lang, winning the role from the runner-up Joseph Gordon-Levitt. This is followed by announcements of Michael Douglas as Hank Pym, Evangeline Lilly as Hope Van Dyne, Michael Pena as Luis, and Patrick Wilson as Darren Cross. Edgar Wright hires cinematographer Bill Pope, the legend behind the lens of The Matrix, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 and 3, Scott Pilgrim, and later on for Marvel Studios' Shang-Chi. And as fate would have it, the cinematographer for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. January 2014, the friction begins. According to the MCU book, Wright and Cornish deal with an endless stream of new notes from this creative committee. So what is this committee? This is a brain trust assembled by Marvel CEO Ike Perlmutter in the design of Pixar's brain trust created by Steve Jobs. But the Marvel committee included Marvel Entertainment president and Ike Perlmutter's mouthpiece, Alan Fine, Marvel Comics legends, Brian Michael Bendis, Joe Quesada, and Dan Buckley, and from the studio side, Kevin Feige and Louis Desposito. This brain trust was really though based out of New York and reportedly through Ike Perlmutter and Alan Fine, averse to any film that they believed they couldn't sell toys with as they came into the Marvel game through a successful toy company called Toy Biz. And in Perlmutter's view, they could not profit from sales of any toys that would include women and non-white heroes. Not the best guy in this watcher's view. According to the MCU book, the committee's notes for Ant-Man included questions about Hank Pym's past with S.H.I.E.L.D. and a relationship to Tony Stark's father, Howard. Wright and Cornish revised their script, trying to preserve their original tone, however, until March 2014, when Wright and the committee agreed to postpone the beginning of production to the month of July to sort out script issues. At this point, Marvel Studios hands off Wright's script to an in-house writer who does a new pass to address all of the creative committee's notes. All of the notes. So who was this writer? In the early years, Marvel Studios was experimenting with an in-house writers program that included emergent screenwriters like Christopher Yost, who wrote on Thor The Dark World and Thor Ragnarok, Edward Rycourt, writer of the Now You See Me films and episodes of Jessica Jones, Nicole Perlman, writer of the first drafts of Guardians of the Galaxy and Captain Marvel, Joe Robert Cole, co-writer of both the Black Panther films, Drew Pierce, writer of an early version of Runaways and co-writer of Iron Man 3 with Shane Black, and Eric Pearson, who wrote on the scripts of Thor Ragnarok and Black Widow. This writer's program was initially overseen by Marvel producer Stephen Broussard, who was Kevin Feige's former assistant, but then taken over by Nate Moore. Actually, after the success of the 2012 Avengers film, Joss Whedon's new contract with Marvel allowed him to do writing passes on all Phase 2 Marvel movies to set up Age of Ultron for the most success in intercontinuity. But according to Joss Whedon, Edgar Wright's draft of Ant-Man was perfect. No notes. Joss Whedon says, quote, I thought that script was not only the best script that Marvel had ever had, but the most Marvel script I'd read. I had no interest in Ant-Man, I read the script. I was like, of course, this is so good. So the mystery in-house writer was not Joss Whedon. It was likely just one of those writers just trying to do their job to carry out orders from the committee, while Kevin Feige was across town trying to dodge Amy Pascal sandwiches. But Edgar Wright is horrified by this new draft. According to the MCU book, the story is mostly the same, but swaths of dialogue have changed, and references to the wider MCU were shoehorned in. Shoehorned! Oh, one shot energy, huh? I think I'll try it. Whoa! <gasps> so, what does one shot's focus shoe do? So 
uh, one shot really is all you need. Begin your transformation with one shot energy today by going to oneshotenergy.com slash new rock stars for 10% off your order. Which leads us to our May 23rd, 2014 nexus point. Edgar Wright leaves publicly and his department heads all drop like flies. Cinematographer Bill Pope, production designer Marcus Rowland. Patrick Wilson has to leave due to scheduling conflicts. Kevin Feige later said, I wish it wasn't as late in the day as it was, but it had just become clear that there was an impasse that we had never reached before. We've worked with lots of unbelievable talented filmmakers like Edgar before, and of course there are disagreements along the way. We had always found a way around it, a way to battle through it, and emerge on the other side with a better product. It just became clear that both of us was just being too polite over the past eight years, I guess. Then it was clear that, oh, you're really not going to do that note? All right, this isn't working. Edgar Wright would later say, I wanted to make a Marvel movie, but I don't think they really wanted to make an Edgar Wright movie. Having written all my other movies, that's a tough thing to move forward. Suddenly becoming a director for hire on it, you're sort of less emotionally invested and you start to wonder why you're there, really. It's now summer 2014. Edgar Wright's script is revised by Paul Rudd and Adam McKay, who said that they fleshed out the character of Hope Van Dyne after Evangeline Lilly had almost walked from the film due to Wright's departure. So this new draft included a new flashback prologue with Howard Stark and Peggy Carter and Hank Pym and a sequence with Falcon and Avengers Compound. Peyton Reed is announced as director. Corey Stoll replaces Patrick Wilson as Darren Cross. August 2014, Kevin Feige finally wins his Cold War against the creative committee after the surprise success of Guardians of the Galaxy, a movie that they fought. Disney chief Bob Iger finally told Ike Perlmutter and the committee to back off of Feige and let Marvel Studios move forward with a bigger budgeted Civil War with Robert Downey Jr. to move forward with a Black Panther film and move forward with a Captain Marvel film. Kevin Feige now had full creative control over the studio and he laid out his new grand plan in October 2014 at Kevin Kahn at the El Capitan Theater. July 2015, the Ant-Man film releases, making $180 million in North America and $519 million globally. Not Avengers level money, but enough money so that Ant-Man could return in Civil War, in Ant-Man and the Wasp, in Avengers Endgame, and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. The 2023 launch to Marvel's Phase 5 and Multiverse Saga that introduced Kang the Conqueror to be this franchise's next arc villain. Peyton Reed himself helps cast Jonathan Majors in the role, and he would first appear in Loki Season 1. Most recently, November 2023, Edgar Wright finally opens up on Instagram, saying, Having signed an NDA when I left, there's not much I can say. I guess the biggest, pun intended, differences in our screenplay was that it was self-contained and didn't have cameos from other MCU characters apart from an NTs, and it was much more of a crime heist movie with interlocking robberies and heists throughout, a little like Donald Westlake's The Hot Rock. I think the crucial difference too was that, like the original comic, Scott Lang was an actual criminal at the start of the film and not already a 100% good guy. We felt it was a more satisfying redemption arc if he went from criminal to hero. So we take you back to our nexus moment in May 2014. What if Amy Pascal never threw her sandwich at Kevin Feige? What if she shook his hand for that Spider-Man Civil War deal right there on the Sony lot. Kevin Feige's coup of Marvel Studios would have come three months earlier, and he would not have had those troubles of summer 2014. So imagine it, a triumphant Kevin Feige drives from Sony in Culver City to Marvel's offices on Disney Burbank studio lot. He drops by Nate Moore's office to tell him, now that I got Spider-Man, there's no way the committee will stop us from doing Black Panther. By the way, how are those latest notes on Ant-Man? Moore says, well, one of our writers applied all the notes the committee wanted. Take a look. And Feige reaches out a hand unsmeared by Amy Pascal's spicy brown mustard, grabs the script, flips through it, and tells Nate Moore, you know what? Tell the committee to shove it. We're shooting Edgar Wright's Ant-Man as is. The script is locked. So from here, dear viewer, we skew into a branch timeline. It's summer 2014. Edgar Wright moves forward with his version of Ant-Man. Corey stole Modoc. erased Patrick Wilson as Darren Cross Yellow Jacket. There's no Howard Stark Peggy Carter prologue. There's no Falcon fight at the Avengers compound. Bill Pope shoots incredible action scenes, including the ones we saw in the final film that Wright originally conceived. The gun barrel run, the toy train fight. It's now July 2015. Edgar Wright's Ant-Man opens with Scott Lang not on his way out of prison as a good guy who just tried to stop his evil employer Vistacorp, but a straight up criminal. Remember, Edgar Wright cited The Hot Rock, which begins with Robert Redford leaving prison and taking a job to steal what? A gem from a Brooklyn museum that is of great significance to a country in Africa from which it was stolen during colonial times. Wait, 
a minute, you might ask. Does this not sound like the introduction to Killmonger in the London Museum in Black Panther, a script written by Marvel in-house writer Joe Robert Cole? In this alternate timeline, Kevin Feige and Nate Moore, who are now eager to fast-track Black Panther and set up his appearance in Civil War, turn out to bully Edgar Wright even more aggressively to merge his Ant-Man concept with the broader MCU anyway. That's right, the committee notes weren't coming from New York, they were coming from inside the house. But as men who know how to work a Hollywood set, they do it with more finesse, and they make a better case than the committee did, with more respect for Edgar Wright's vision. So instead of a shoehorned Falcon cameo, Feige and Moore softly encourage Edgar Wright to include a Black Panther cameo, and a plot to recover stolen vibranium from Wakanda, stolen by Patrick Wilson, Darren Cross, using vibranium dealer Ulysses Claw from Age of Ultron, which would give Yellow Jacket in this version of Ant-Man a suit of vibranium. Now, our Edgar Wright would bristle at these MCU tie-ins, but they do fit in more organically with his plan to follow the hot rock. And this way, he's allowed to maintain Scott Lang as an anti-hero, which is always more important to him anyway. He sticks with this Scott plus Hank Heist with Michael Douglas in a Romancing the Stone throwback, but in Wakanda, and the movie works. Rather than making 500 million globally, Ant-Man, as a team up with T'Challa in a prelude to Black Panther, becomes an even bigger hit, making 800 million worldwide, leading us to alternate 2016. Rather than Marvel Phase 2 and 3 movies shot with the desaturated tones and poor lighting and steady cam of the Russo brothers, the MCU now becomes known for a vibrant, clean, Scott Pilgrimy visual language brought by Edgar Wright and Bill Pope. 2017. Since Wright and Cornish's draft left the role of Pope Van Dyne smaller in this universe, any Ant Man sequel now would not further explore the Wasp and the Ant family, but rather Ant Man's role as the MCU's sharpest thief. Edgar Wright now sees the benefit of playing in Kevin Feige's sandbox of characters, and Ant Man's next appearance is a team up with Spider Man in Spider Man Homecoming. Scott Lang, as a criminal, helps fellow empathetic criminal Vulture Adrian Toomes break into Avengers Tower, leading to the Spider vs. the Ant Bug Bowl. 2018 2019, Ant Man now plays an even bigger role in the Infinity War and Endgame films. Rather than waiting for a rat to release him from the quantum realm so he can babble about time dilation and turn into a baby, we learn and that Scott snatched the Time Stone just before Thanos destroyed the Infinity Stones, or found an atom-sized piece of the Time Stone, and the Avengers used this to rewind time. And the time travel logic of Avengers Endgame makes a hell of a lot more sense. 2021, rather than exploring the depths of the quantum realm, Edgar Wright, who is still kicking around his ideas for a heist movie like Baby Driver, or a 60s nostalgia piece like Last Night in Soho, now pitches Marvel on an Ant-Man prequel a la Godfather Part Two, following Old Man Hank Pym, but back in the 1960s, which Marvel now could use to introduce a lineup of the Fantastic Four in the 1960s. So, in this revised timeline, Marvel no longer uses an Ant-Man sequel to introduce Kang the Conqueror, a villain who has very little to do with Ant-Man historically in the comics, but instead establishes the Ant-Man legacy as a lineage with a history with the Fantastic Four and with Victor Von Doom a character who does have a history with Ant-Man, after himself being shrunken down to Microworld, which is why in the comics the Fantastic Four reach out to Ant-Man Hank Pym for help to begin with. So now it is 2023 in the Edgar Wright timeline, and Ant-Man has teamed up at this point with Black Panther, with Spider-Man, with the Avengers. He has darted down the grooves of Thanos' gauntlet, and he brought to the MCU the Fantastic Four and Victor Von Doom. So naturally, Edgar Wright is hired to direct Marvel's Fantastic Four. It's his moment in the sun. And to fill out this cast, Edgar Wright relies on the actors that he ended up casting for Baby Driver in our timeline, John Hamm as Reed Richards, Aza Gonzalez as Stu Storm, Ansel Elgort as Johnny Storm, Jamie Foxx as Ben Grimm, and who better than Kevin Spacey as Dr. Victor Von Doom? Wait. Oh, no, 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 no. No. Oh, God, no. No. No, 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 no. Uh, it seems like no matter what, the multiverse saga is destined to be a bit complicated. Edgar Wright is, of course, a more interesting director when he's not trying to build a cinematic universe, just as we've learned that directors like Taika Waititi are destined to be bored with this kind of world building. The reality is, we would have gotten one good Edgar Wright Ant-Man film, and then Marvel Studios would have watered down the character so that he'd better fit with their vision for Civil War in the Infinity Saga, and we would be having the same what-if-thought experiments. Meanwhile, the traditional
trajectory of Amy Pascal's pastrami on rye had much further consequences than Feige's blindness to Ant-Man, which merits further discussion on a future episode. But the more Marvel Studios struggles to align its vision with bold directors, we will always look back at Edgar Wright's Ant-Man and wonder what if.